Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem cheapest flights within K stops. I think this is a really good interview question because there's so many different ways to solve this problem and there's a lot of different trade-offs that you can discuss. The main way that I'm actually going to be solving this problem is by using the Bellman Ford algorithm, which is an algorithm that we haven't really gone over on this channel before. So I think this is a good opportunity to go over it. So to explain the problem, this is obviously a graph problem as you can see from the picture. We're given a bunch of nodes. Each node represents a city and each edge in the graph represents, obviously they are directed edges as you can see from the arrow down here. So each edge represents a flight that connects two cities together. For example, city zero and city one are connected together meaning we can go from city zero down to city one. We can travel along this uh, flight and the edge actually does have a weight. So in this case, it's a hundred. So that represents the cost or the price to go from city zero to city one. And we're asked a very simple question. We're given a source node, in this case, city zero, and a destination node, in this case, city two. We're asked a simple question of, what is the cheapest price traveling from city zero to city two? The only catch here is that we can only do at most K stop. So that's really the catch of this problem, because as you know, we know an algorithm that can calculate shortest paths, right? Even with weighted edges, this algorithm can, uh, can calculate shortest paths, and it's called Jixtra's algorithm. But we can't use it easily in this problem because we're given a condition of at most K stops. So if we try to take that idea and then incorporate it into Jixtra's algorithm, it's not super efficient, but it is still doable. But there's another algorithm that also calculates shortest paths, and that is called the Bellman-Ford algorithm. And with this shortest path algorithm, we can incorporate the idea of at most K stops and also do it efficiently. The overall time complexity is actually going to be, uh, let's say, E, where E is the number of edges and K is the input parameter that we're given at most K stops. The way it's going to work is it's going to be similar to a breadth first search approach. In general, though, the Bellman-Ford algorithm actually runs in E times V time, where V is the number of vertices, E is the number of edges. But in this case, we're given a condition of K. So the time complexity in this case is just going to be E times K. And by the way, looking at this problem, what is the solution? Well, obviously we have a, a direct edge linking zero to two. Obviously the cost is 500 in that case, but we do have a second path. If we go all the way to one, costs 100, and then we go from one to two, then another 100. So that in total is going to be 200. Not too bad, right? This is shorter. Like, uh, I mean, the price is smaller and this does fit within our criteria. Obviously this path how many stops did this path have? You might think it's two because we had we traveled along two different edges, but when we say stops, we're just calculating what's the number of cities between the, the starting point and the destination. There was only one city in between them, so that means we did fit the criteria of down here. We were given k equals one. We can only have one, at most, one stop in between the source uh, and the destination. So we were, we did fit that criteria. So in this case, the result is going to be 200 because this path is a valid path. So now let's try to understand how Bellman Ford algorithm can actually help us. So now let's try to understand the Bellman Ford algorithm. And just to give you a little bit of a background on Bellman Ford, it's actually a pretty general algorithm. There's different implementations of it. One of the benefits of Bellman Ford is that it can actually deal with the negative weights, which is something Jixtra's algorithm can't deal with. But in this case, obviously we don't have negative weights. So what we're going to be focusing on is what we actually need from the Bellman Ford algorithm to solve this problem. So we do have a source node A in this case, and we have a destination node C in this case. So the main idea with this algorithm is to start at the source node A, so in this case, this node, and then slowly do a breadth first search, right? So from A, first we would look at what's the first layer of nodes that we can reach within one stop, right? Within one stop, okay, we can reach uh, B and C. And then we'd continue that breadth first search and say, okay, now within two stops, how many different nodes can we reach? Well, can't really go anywhere from here, can't go anywhere from here, but from here we can go 
to this uh, position C. And in doing this breadth first search, we're going to simultaneously be keeping track of for each node that we have visited or can visit, what is the minimum price that it takes to reach that node? Because remember, that's what we're trying to solve. We're trying to find from starting at A, going to see what's the minimum cost it would take within K stops. So that's something I didn't mention yet. In this case, we have K equals one, right? So since K equals one, what's the breadth for search gonna be? Does that mean we're only gonna do one layer of breadth for search? No, we're actually gonna be doing K plus one layers of breadth for search. And that's that has nothing to do with Bellman Ford. That just has to do with how this problem is defined. They just define to us that we can do at most K stops between the starting position and the destination, right? So this would be one stop between these two nodes. So you're probably wondering, why do I have this second temporary array of prices? I'll get more into that in a moment. For now, I would just kind of focus on the general idea of what we're doing. So if we're doing a breadth first search and we're starting at A, what's the cost, the minimum cost from starting at A to reach A? Well, it's going to be zero, of course, right? And so far, if we've only reached A, what's the minimum cost to reach B and C? We're just going to put that as infinity for now. So now we're going to do the breadth first search portion. But the thing about this breadth for search is it's not implemented how you would think. We're not just going to look at A and only look at the neighbors of A. We're actually going to go through every single edge in this graph. So, for example, let's go at the first edge. Okay, this edge has a weight of 100. It connects A to node B. So now the question is, we can reach B along this edge. Did we find a new minimum path to be able to reach this node B? Did we or did we not? Well, as of right now, the value is infinity. We found a way to reach node B with what's the cost to reach node B? It's whatever the cost is to reach node A, right? Which we already know is zero, right? So we're going to say zero plus whatever the weight of this edge is, which is a hundred, right? So the overall cost to reach node B is a hundred. That's less than infinity, which is what we have. So we can get rid of this infinity and then put a hundred. But when we update this value, we're not going to update it in the original prices array. We're going to update it in the temporary prices array. And then once we've completely updated the temporary prices array, we're going to go ahead and put all of the values in the new prices array. So we went over this edge already. Now let's look at another edge. Let's take a look at this edge 500. It connects A to C, right? So how much did it take to reach node A? We know that's already zero, right? Okay, so going from node A, which costs zero to get to, plus 500, which is this edge to get to C. So, it, so we found a way to get to node C with a cost of 500. Is this smaller than the current minimum that we have for C, which is infinity. Yes, it's smaller. So we can replace this with infinity, but of course we're going to do it in the temporary prices array. Next, we're going to look at this third and final edge, even though this edge is not connected to A, right? I said this was a breadth for search, but I guess it's not technically a breadth for search because we are looking at all edges. But notice what's going to happen when we look at this edge. Okay, we found a way to go from node B to get to node C, and it costs 100 to do that. Did we find a new minimum to get to node C? Well, the first question is, how? what's the cost to actually get to B? To get to B is infinity. It's not 100. 100 is what we determined. But for now, we're going to be using this original value. I'll explain why in a moment. It takes a infinity to get to node B. So to get to node C takes infinity plus 100. That's not smaller than infinity, right? So anytime we get to an infinity in the source node, right? So we took a look at this edge, right? This is the source. This is the destination. It took an in, it took infinity to get to the source. So we're just going to skip this edge altogether, right? So it technically is a breadth first search because we're skipping edges that we haven't actually gotten to for the source node. And there's a lot of like technical questions you could probably ask. So why am I even you know implementing it this way? Why am I going through all the edges when I could just do a regular breadth for search? The main reason is because the time complexity is not actually going to change. And doing it this way is a lot easier to code. You're going to be surprised how short the code is when I actually show that to you. And to be honest, since the overall time complexity is the same, I think it's much better to go with a readable solution rather than a solution that saves you maybe 10% on the runtime, right? So I think this is one of the cases where simplicity is much better than a slight improvement in performance. 
this is our temporary prices array. And by the way, we are going to have this zero here. So if we updated a value, in this case we did, then we put the values here or the original values will still be there. So what did we discover? What does this array represent? And what does this array represent? Basically, before we started our breadth for search, this is what we had. Now we've done a breadth for search of one layer, and this is what we've determined for the sh for the smallest price to pay to reach each of these nodes. This is what we've done so far for one layer. But how many layers are we going to do? In this case, K is one. Does that mean we're only going to do one layer? Nope. Remember what I said, we're going to do K plus one layers. I know that's kind of confusing, but it's just kind of how the problem is set up. Okay, so now we're going to do our last layer of the BFS. By the way, I replaced our prices with this and temp prices will stay the same. Temp prices is always just going to be a copy of the regular prices. And then when we update values, we're going to put the updated values here, then, you know, reassign them up here and then continue that kind of loop. And of course, we're going to do this K plus one times, right? That's how the breadth for search is going to work. We're going to update this entire array K plus one times. So basically, if the input value was k equals zero, we have that result, right? Within zero stops, uh, this would be the minimum cost to reach the destination node C, 500. But we know k is actually one, so we can have one stop in between the source and the destination. So now, once again, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're just going to go through every single edge. So let's look at this first edge. Okay, we know that from going from A to B, it takes 100, right? So how much does it take to get to A? It takes zero. So it takes zero plus 100 to get to B. Is that smaller than what we have for B? No, it's the exact same, which is what we expect, right? We know within one stop, or we know within zero stops in between, it takes 100 to get there. So have, having an extra stop in between A and B doesn't decrease that is what we found, right? If you have two stops, three stops, four stops between A and B, it doesn't reduce the cost. It's always going to be 100. So this value will stay the same in temp prices. Let's look at the next edge. This is going to be the exact same thing, right? 500 is just going to be the value that we put here. It's already the same. Increasing the number of stops does not decrease the cost to get to C. Uh, at least along this edge. But now we're going to look at the third and final edge, uh, this edge, and it takes from B to get to C, it takes 100. How much does it take to get to B? It takes 100 to get to B, right? So 100 plus the value of this edge, 100 is 200, right? 200 is what it takes to get to C now. So is this 200 smaller than what we currently have for C? Yes, it is. That means we can update the value in temp prices for C. We can change this 500 to a 200. Uh, sorry if it's not readable. I had to put it over here. But 200 is the cost to reach C if we add an extra stop in between. So now that we've gone through every single edge, again, we're going to take all of these, put the values up here, and we're actually done with the loop. We're done with the entire algorithm because we ran it K plus one times. So since this 200, since this 500 up here is going to be a 200, right? That means 200 is the value that we're going to return for the entire result, right? Within one stop in between A and C, which is obviously this route over here, it takes 200 cost to get there. Uh, just an FYI, if we were not actually able to reach this, right, like maybe within K stops, we actually can't even go from A to the destination C. What would we return in that case? Would we just return infinity? No, the way the problem is written, they just want us to return negative one if that's ever the case. So I hope this algorithm makes sense, and I hope you can see why the time complexity is E times K, because the loop is going to run K times, and every time we loop, we're going to be iterating through every single edge in the graph, which is E, so this is where the time complexity comes from. You're probably still wondering why exactly do we have this temporary prices array. If you're not, you can probably skip ahead a minute, but if you are, let me explain that to you. Suppose we change the problem slightly. Suppose instead of having k equals 1, we change it to k equals 0. That means the loop is going to run k plus 1 times. That means the loop is going to run exactly one time. So let's see what happens in that case. What would be the output in that case? If we could only have zero stops in between A and C, what's going to be the cost to reach node C? Of course, it's going to be 500, right? There's only one possible way we can reach C from A if we have zero stops in between. We can't go along this path on the left side because it has 
has one stop in between, we're only allowed zero stops in between. So if we run the algorithm and if we didn't have a temporary prices array, let me show you what would happen. We're gonna go through the first edge 100, right? Okay, we're gonna figure out, okay, it takes 100 to get to B, right? So we can replace this infinity with a 100. Sorry if it's not readable, but this is 100. Next, we're gonna go to the second edge, right? Another 100. What are we gonna say? We're gonna say, okay, how long does it take to reach B? It takes infinity? Nope, it takes 100, right? Because we put that update simultaneously in the exact same prices that we're iterating through, right? We put 100 here. So now what we're gonna say is, okay, how many, how much does it take to reach C? 100 plus 100 that it took to reach node B. So then we'd put a 200 value in the C spot, right? We'd put 200 over here. But what we just did, because we updated the same prices, we didn't have a temporary prices, what we did is we instead used a path that had an extra node along it and we weren't allowed to do that. Look, we had K equals zero. So that's the idea of why we have to use a temporary prices array. Okay, so now let's code it up. And the best part about writing the code with my videos is I spend so much time explaining the solution that now writing the code is gonna be pretty trivial, I bet for most of you. So we're gonna initialize prices to be infinity, right? Where How how big is, in, is prices gonna be? It's gonna be the number of nodes that we're given. That parameter is N. And we're gonna initialize it to all infinity except for the source node. Remember the source node, we're gonna say it takes a price of zero to get to the source node. And that's the only variable we're gonna need. Now we can actually start iterating uh, through the loop. Uh, remember, how many times are we gonna iterate through the loop? We're gonna do k plus one time. So k is the input parameter, we can use that. We can do this loop k plus one times. And once we do that, we're gonna go through every single edge, remember? so. Uh, edges are located in the flights array. So we're gonna go through every flight. Each flight or edge has three values, a source, which I'm gonna say is S, a destination, which is D, right? Going from S to D, each uh, edge is gonna be directed. Each edge is also gonna have a price. So P is gonna be what price is. So iterating through this flights array. Let me just put a comment to tell you uh, what each of those variables means. And remember, before we actually go through this loop, we do want to have a temporary prices array. And what we're, how we're gonna initialize this temporary prices is just gonna be a copy of whatever prices happens to be at this point in time. So just create a, a copy of prices. This temporary prices is where our updates are gonna go. So there's only two conditions we're gonna have to check for. Remember the one special case is if this source node, right? We have an edge, source, destination, and price. If this source node, is not even possible to reach, meaning if the price located at this source node happens to be infinity. That, that means we can't even reach this source node if it's equal to infinity. So in that case, we're just gonna continue the loop, right? We don't want to check these edges. And the only other case that we're gonna look for is if we found a new shortest path to the destination node D. So if we wanna know what's the price to actually reach the source node S so far, what's the minimum price to reach the source node S? We know it's definitely not gonna be infinity because we just checked that up above. So whatever that price happens to be, plus whatever is the price of this particular edge that we're iterating through. So the price to reach S plus this edge connecting S with D. So if this is smaller than whatever the minimum price is to reach the destination, then we're gonna update that weight, or, or rather, we're gonna update that price. And we're not gonna be checking this prices array, we're actually gonna be checking if it's smaller than the temp prices array, because it could be possible that through this single loop, we updated this value already once, right? This temporary prices array. So if we update it multiple times, we want that update to be reflected. We want it to, we want to just make sure that we're getting the minimum value is what I'm getting at. So if it's smaller than that, then we're gonna be be uh, updating this to uh, be this new minimum that we just found, right? This happens to be smaller than this, so it's time to do an update. So we can just copy and paste this into uh, this line of code. That's all for this for loop. So once we're done updating those minimums, uh, the last thing we're gonna have to do is take temporary prices and then reassign it to be prices. So prices can be updated to be just like this. And 
really, that is the entire implementation of Bellman Ford, at least for the context of this problem. We don't need any min heaps or anything like Jigstra's algorithm. And then finally, we can return the result. What are we going to return? We're going to return prices of D, right? We want to know the minimum price to reach a destination. Actually, not D. We're going to be using dest because that's the input parameter that we're given up above over here. Uh, but remember, it could be infinity. If it's equal to infinity, so let's say if uh, this is equal to float of infinity, then we actually want to return negative one. So return negative one if this condition is true. If this condition is not true, then we can just return whatever the actual minimum price happens to be. Okay, so now let's run it to make sure that it works. It doesn't have an amazing runtime on leak code. So you can see that it does work and it's relatively efficient. You can make it slightly more efficient, I think if you use like a hash map and stuff. But I think for the most part, and especially for interviews, that definitely won't be a factor. So I really hope this was helpful. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a really long video and it's gonna probably be a pain to edit. So I do hope it was helpful if it was please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot. Consider checking out my Patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.